Sheikh Omar Shaheen was born in Egypt, where he began his Islamic training at a young age under the supervision of his father, who was a sheikh of their village. He memorized the Quran at the age of 12 in various modes of recitation. He continued his Islamic education, graduating from the Institute for Preparation of Preachers with a diploma in Islamic studies, as well as studying at Al Furqan Institute. He then traveled here to, the, to America in 1999, where he studied computer engineering. He continued to study with many scholars, receiving, receiving from them ijazat in various Islamic sciences. His studies including the Maliki, Maliki Madhab, he also pursued a bachelor's at Al-Azhar University in the Islamic Sciences and Arabic language, um, and a master's at the Islamic University of Minnesota of Islamic Studies. He has been an imam at various locations, but right now, currently, he's the imam of the Davis Masjid. Uh, so please give him a round warm of applause. Bismillah. I can't raise my voice any higher. I just did a surgery on my vocal cord, so please forgive me. If, can you all hear me clearly, inshallah? Alhamdulillah. Bismillah, alhamdulillah. I'll just, out of respect, stand up because you guys are here to listen, so this is the least we could do for you, inshallah. I don't know if I'm going to be able to stand for an hour, but. Hopefully we'll make it shorter than that, inshaAllah. Bismillah, alhamdulillah, salatu salam, rasulullah, ala alihi wa sahbihi, man wa lahu, taba'u da'u la'u middin. First, welcome to UC Davis, and welcome to Davis, inshaAllah, jazakumullah khair, all for coming and showing up tonight. Um, the theme, as the sister mentioned, inshaAllah, uh, in the story of Musa and al-Khidr, mentioned in Surah Al-Kahf, and I'll try to make it as a, a story-wise to benefit from the entire story, inshallah, through the reading and the recitation. But first, um, the khidmah or service that uh, the sister was speaking about. Dealing with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we have two forms of ibadah, two forms of worship. We have what we call ibadat, there are worship, and we have what we call muamalat, dealing with others. So when we're talking about our service to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that could only happen through correct knowledge and how to implement it. And out of that, we gain the other part, which is the, that we are acquired to do service to other people. Part of our religion says that. It's not just recommended, as you hear now from the hadith of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. The best of example, if we want to talk about the ibadat or the khidmah or service, you would assume it will be, okay, everybody is asleep already, mashallah. Okay, so who, who, would you th who do you think that would be the best of example that we could give tonight? If you want to learn from someone tonight how to do your service or how to deliver your service to Allah and how do you deliver your service to others? Who would be a best of example? Huh? Yeah, just shout it out. That's I'm fine with that. Thank you. Anybody else? So we all agree with the brother, inshallah? Alhamdulillah. We don't usually agree as Muslims, but that's, that's good. Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So I want you to just memorize these two hadith with me, inshallah. First hadith. They're both narrated by his wife, Aisha radiallahu anhu arda. She said, when the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam entered his house, he will be at his family's service. He would wash the dishes, he cleaned the house, he'll vacuum the house. And I know some people after, they'll tell me they didn't have vacuum. All right, that's not the point. And right, the point is, you get it, they cleaned the house, all right? Dishes. He didn't have dishes, but they clean whatever they had, right? And we're going to learn through the story of Musa. I hope, inshallah, that we learn how to ask the right question at the right time and when to skip. You know, because sometimes we leave the whole story and we, ah, it doesn't make sense. They had vacuum at Rasulullah's time. That's not true. And then that's on YouTube. The Sheikh said they had vacuum, All right? So that part, so Aisha said he was at the service of his family. He cleaned the house, fixed his clothes, he'll help us with the house. Now, as soon as the adhan is called, 
he is as if he does not recognize us. So now the Prophet Sallallahu did both. His service to Allah, which comes first. And then his service to others. So we have two extreme. We have people who think that our religion relies upon sitting at the masjid, having the long, uh, what do you guys call it? I know every language is different. Masbaha, tasbih, the bees, you know, that they start counting on. All right? Dressing a certain way, and this is the deen. And then we have the other extreme who thinks that, you know, serving the community, being involved, being active, which is a good thing, but then I can't do the salah because I'm at the service of others. Both are extreme. Our deen is always a moderate in between. Your service to Allah comes through knowledge and applying that knowledge in your life. And if you don't know Allah, you wouldn't be able to worship him correctly. If you don't have that knowledge, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, when he first recommended, he said, فَعْلَمْ أَنَّهُ لَا إِلَهَ إِلَّا اللَّهِ Know that there is no God but Allah. That knowledge that Musa alayhi salam wanted to develop in his life, like we're going to speak about inshallah in seconds, that knowledge leads to knowing Allah better. And this is the service of Allah. Now out of that service, you're serving your community and other people, which is part of the command of Allah. But surprisingly, Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was able to achieve the service to others before the service to Allah. Agree or disagree? Or agree to disagree? What's wrong? Yes or no? Yeah? The hadith of Khadija, when Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam came down from the mountain, day one, when the revolution started, and he said, cover me. And she said, what happened? He said, I'm afraid that something might have happened to me. She said what to him? Anybody know? What did she say to him? This is a smart wife. She didn't say, what happened? What's going on? You know, you know, first thing when your husband, anyone married here? For How many people are married? Okay, so I won't talk about husband and wife relation then. That's not, it's not as important. <clears throat> Maybe for future wise, inshallah, yeah. If you're married, just... When you see your husband coming into the house, frustrated, tired, just give him some time to breathe first, and then start telling him all the list of problems that happened during the day. Same thing to the husband, inshallah. But anyway, she said, what did she say to him? Anybody know? Yes. Huh? Can you? <laughs> huh? You want the mic? I think she's right, but I didn't hear anything. <laughs> I didn't hear anything. Okay, she, she said a she said few things. Number one, she said? Uh, she said he takes care of the poor. Okay, take care of the poor. Help the people in need. Be generous to the, his guest. And keeps his ties with his kingship. Right? All of these are what? What could we say? All of these actions are, they could be under one title, which is social work. Yeah? You agree? That's Rasulullah So he was not strange to the community, by the way. When he came in, Rasulullah came in to say, I am Rasulullah. They didn't say, excuse me, where have you been? No, they recognized him. They knew him. Through what? Again, through his service. And this is the part that we want to focus as Muslim. Ibn Abbas radiallahu anhu arda once, can I ask question and give gifts or no gifts? Okay, good. I'm putting them in trouble, so I don't have anything to give you guys, so whatever they give you, inshallah. Rasul Ibn Abbas said, he came out of the masjid running. So somebody stopped him and he said, why are you running out of the masjid? He said, I'm going to help someone. The person told Ibn Abbas, he said, you had the intention to do i'tikaf. Anybody know what i'tikaf is? I'tikaf only happens, we only happens with us once during, only, yeah? 
Should be during the year, but we only do in Ramadan, mashallah. Yeah, we're so spiritual. But anyway, Ramadan only, yeah? I'tikaf. I'tikaf means to spend some time in the masjid for the sake of Allah. Great reward. So Ibn Abbas said, he told him, didn't you have the intention to spend time in the masjid? He said, wallahi, serving and helping someone is better than spending one month in the masjid of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa Now, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, okay, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, okay, let's, all right, let's make a deal here. Are we all Muslims? Alhamdulillah. Yes or? <laughs> okay, you guys don't know my style. When I ask, I, I'm just waiting for an answer. Are we all Muslims? Alhamdulillah. So when I say Rasulullah, what should we say? Thank you. So if you don't say that, I'm leaving. I'm going to give you three strikes like Musa <laughs> alayhi salam. Right? And after that, هَذَا فِرَاقُ بَيْنِي وَبَيْنِكَ This is the end, okay? Agree? Yeah, Musa agreed, so you have to agree on that. Taib. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wasallam said in the hadith, he said, the best of people are those who are more beneficial to others. And now underline the word others. He didn't say to Muslims. He didn't say to neighbors. He didn't say to friends. He said others. To keep it general, the most beneficial the best of people are the most beneficial to, huh, to others. This is the recommendation from the Sunnah of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa Now, how do we know, how do we do it right? How do we know when, to, when are we crossing the line and when are we stopping? How do we know that our service are accepted? How do we know when to do it and for what purpose? Because everybody has their own reason. There are people who do service because they want to do it. Huh. This is not an accusation, huh? But to show off, they just want to take that picture, selfie with the orphan, post it on Facebook, and then they get a million likes. And then they tell the orphan, okay, have a nice day, I'll see you next year for the next picture. Yeah? There are people like that. There are people who do things because they want others to praise them. There are others who do, who does things, great, great actions. But they are doing it for a worldly matter. To get a prize. To be recognized. Whatever reason. In our life as Muslims, we should know that every service that we do, after serving Allah, because this is what we are created for. Yeah? We are considered slaves or Non-slaves, which one? Yeah, we're in trouble now. Slavery back to America, 2020. Muslims are saying we are slaves. Slavery, slavery is best defined when it's to Allah and it's worth when it's regarding people or others. So when you say, I am the slave or the servant of Allah, your ranks are being raised because you're serving the one who commanded you to serve him. While if you serve others or being a slave of others, you're humiliating yourself or being humiliated by others. So now, every service that we do should be for the sake of Allah because Allah has commanded us to do that. Not for any other reason. And we're going to learn that through the life of Musa alayhi, alayhi salam. So the first thing that I want to mention, already five minutes left? Oh, alhamdulillah. You scared me. Come on. Imam al-Bukhari, rahimahullah. Anybody know who Imam al-Bukhari is? Alhamdulillah. No, not the one on YouTube. You guys know al-Bukhari, right? He died. Yeah, because this guy came, Egyptian dude, he came and he said, I said, do you know al-Bukhari? He said, yeah, I uh, took a picture with him. <laughs> I said, okay, that's... Maybe he knows someone named al-Bukhari and then... He actually took a picture with the actor who did a movie about Bukhari. So he, and he was swearing that, Wallahi, I saw Bukhari. I said, yeah, you did. <laughs> Can't lie. Okay. Imam Bukhari, rahimahullah, <clears throat> titled chapter saying, Babu al-ilmi qabla al-qawli wal-amal. 
the chapter of ilm, knowledge, before qawl, statement, saying, and actions. So he said, this chapter, I need to focus on action, uh, knowledge before saying or acting. If you don't have knowledge, you won't go on. So in the story of Musa alayhi salam, which the brother would read to you, inshallah, just for me to take some rest and break, inshallah, we'll mention how Musa alayhi salam, what service did he do? What do we learn from it? And I'm going to go through the verses, and I hope, inshallah, that the verses are, or the seer are interested. So we'll listen to the brother recitation of few verses, and then we'll do the explanation of it, and then we'll move on to the other verses till we finish the whole story of Musa and Al-Khidr, inshallah. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. وَإِذْ قَالَ مُوسَى لِفَتَاهُ لَا أَبْرَحُ حَتَّى أَبْلُغَ مَجْمَعَ الْبَحْرَيْنِ أَوْ أَمْضِيَ حُقُبًا فَلَمَّا بَلَغَ مَجْمَعَ بَيْنِهِمَا نَسِيَ حُوتَهُمَا فَاتَّخَذَ سَبِيلَهُ فِي الْبَحْرِ سَرَبًا فلما جاوزا قال لفتاه آتنا غداءنا لقد لقينا من سفرنا هذا نصبا قال أرأيت إذ أوينا إلى الصخرة فإن نسيت الحوت وما أنسانيه إلا الشيطان أن أذكره واتخذ سبيله في البحر عجبا قال ذلك ما كنا نبغ فارتدا على آثاره ما قصصا ما شاء الله تكبير I don't want anybody to give him the evil eye tonight. We need him for the rest of the night, inshallah. He said, وَإِذْ قَالَ مُوسَى When Musa said, لِفَتَاهُ To his servant or to his young follower or his student, لَا أَبْرَحُ I will not leave here حَتَّى Till I reach the, the place where the two seas meet. أَوْ أَمْضِيَ حُقُبَ Or if I continue walking for a long period of time. Now, Imam al-Bukhari mentioned this story to prove the hardship of knowledge. And Musa alayhi salam was asked by Bani Israel. He said, someone asked him, he said, Ya Musa, man a'lamu nas Who is the most knowledgeable? Okay? He said, me. Somebody might ask, isn't that a form of arrogance? Like, astaghfirullah ala he should be humbled. Well, they are Bani Israel. This is the first problem. They're troublemakers. And they're asking their prophet, their prophet, whom they know he's the most knowledgeable. Somebody comes up and said, what? Who's the most knowledgeable? Well, Sometimes students need to respect, and this is point one. Students need to understand through this. The, if you really want Allah to give you the benefit of knowledge, First and most important that you respect the knowledge that you're gaining and the teacher that is teaching you. Even if you disagree, there's fine, there's a difference between disagreeing, like we'll see, and disrespecting someone. It's fine to disagree, no problem. And with, with evidence and proofs, but disrespect is not part of the deen. So they're saying to Musa, who's the most knowledgeable? He said, me. Sometimes it's hard to be humbled, meaning situations where you can't be humbled. Like if you stand up in a classroom and you say, you know, I don't have enough knowledge uh, to teach you guys. Um, what's, your, what's your favorite subject? Don't tell me math. I know Davis. Everybody in Davis are terrible with math. Right? We already experienced that. I have asked 35 plus 25, they go, up there, a calculator. That's a problem. I already know my city, you know, I'm, yeah, I'm, I'm not accusing anybody else, only Davis, all right? I don't know about other cities. So chemistry, 
if he stands up here and he says, class one, you know, I don't know a lot about chemistry. I'm not knowledgeable. I don't have enough knowledge. And everybody's going to go, then what are you doing here? Yeah? It, it is hard. So Musa alayhi salam can say at this place, Allahu alam, you know, I, I don't know. He said me to tell him I am your prophet. So it was a clear answer. One. Two, Musa alayhi salam knew that he's the most knowledgeable because he's a prophet. As much as he doesn't know anybody else who's more knowledgeable than him. So he said to him, me, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala taught him a lesson by saying that there is another person that at this place where the two seas meet and you have to travel till you get to that area where there's a sign. When you see this sign, you'll find that man. So he traveled. He took his son or his servant, his student, Yusha ibn Nun in some narration, and he moved on. They traveled. They had a fish. I'm just running through the story quickly. They had a fish, cooked fish. The sign was that this fish at a certain place, Allah would return it back to life and it will travel in the sea. Where the fish travels, where it ends, that's where you find this man that you're looking for. So they took what they were commanded to and they traveled. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, فَلَمَّا بَلَغَ Okay? So he said, I'm not, I will travel till I meet him, even if it takes a long period of time. For a student of knowledge, what do you think we learned from that long period of time? One word. Starts with a C, O. There you go, make it easy for you guys. So don't tell me now, you know, humbleness. All right, it starts with a C, O. He said, even if it takes a long period of time, if you want to succeed, you want to be successful in your life, you need this word that we learn in Musa's story. What, what is it? C-O. And it ends with an E-N-T. Huh? Yeah, no gift because I made it easy for you. Yeah. <laughs> Commitment. If you don't have that in your life, Commitment is very important. Musa said, I don't care how long it will take. You know, surprisingly, Musa could have said this. Who's the most knowledgeable? I don't care. I have enough knowledge already. I'm the prophet of Allah. And I could ask Allah, you know, whatever knowledge he has, just send it to me. No. He was committed to learn. He wanted that. He, he worked hard for it. So he traveled. Then Allah said, when they met at the two sea, they forgot the fish. Word sarab is like sharab, but you can't see it. So the, 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 the fish start traveling in the sea and they forgot about it. Where did the fish travel to? Allah said, meaning where the two seas what? Meet, yeah? Where is that at? Anybody know the area? Okay, it doesn't matter right now. So I'll, so I'll skip on it. I'll come back to it, inshallah. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, فَلَمَّا جَوَزَ Okay. Let me tell you something here. Did Allah tell us where the fish got lost or where the fish traveled? No, right? So what did Allah emphasize about where, how the sea looked like? Or how Musa traveled, whether he was walking or riding. Did Allah mention that in the story so far? No, right? So this is the first lesson. Whatever in the Quran that was emphasized, if you really want to learn, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala emphasizes in the Quran, then you should consider it. And whatever Allah de-emphasize, then don't worry about it. A lot of people, this is what they do. Beginning of the surah. Surah Al-Kahf. We read every Friday. There are a group of men who traveled and they got lost. When they got lost and then they died later on in a cave, the first thing that people start asking was what? Huh? How many, How many people were there? They saw dead people in, all right? And instead of saying, let's do something, they started doing what? Arguing. Some people said three. Some people said five. Some people said seven, correct? Oh, did Allah mention how many? 
Allah said, Qur Rabbi a'lamu bi'iddatim. Allah knows how many they were. So you don't need to worry about it. And this is the part, like, I just recall right now in the story of Yusuf alayhi salam. Everybody know Yusuf alayhi salam, yeah? In the story of Yusuf, who's the main figure after Yusuf in the story? Human being. Huh? His dad. Good. How about his mom? Mentioned? This is what Muslims do in the class. Sheikh? Yes. What's his mom's name? 17 pages about his dad. Yeah, but what's his mom's name? Why? Well, you care so much about, mashallah, women's rights. Okay, go read, go read Musa's story. Musa's talking about what? His mom, yeah? Then when we get to Musa, he says, where's his dad? <laughs> That's the problem. It is a problem with Muslims. Every, every story is like that. They, they start asking you, what tree did Adam eat from? Okay, apple. So then what? Oh, apple's haram now? <laughs> Is there a point? There's no point, you know. One of the imma, Imam Shabi, rahimullah, he was a, more of a comedian scholar. <laughs> Colin, yeah. Somebody came to me and said, Ya Sheikh, he said what? He said, Iblis is male or female? He said, male, Iblis, shaitan. He said, okay, that means he had a wife. Said, yeah. And he had children. Yeah. And where is that in the Quran? So the Sheikh mentioned in Surah Al-Kahf, Allah said, him, don't follow Iblis and his offspring. Then the man kept asking. And they, so they produce, they live and they die. Yes. And Iblis don't die, yes. And then come on. Then he said, What was Iblis's wife's name? The Sheikh said, Sorry, brother, I wasn't invited to the wedding. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't get the card. I don't know, Allah. What if. <laughs> If you know his wife's name, what's, what benefit? Do you, do you get the point, inshallah? I don't want to go along with a comedy show today. I just want to make it. Um, <clears throat> Subhanallah. So when something, okay, let's, let's skip that point, inshallah. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, فلما جاوزا, when they passed, meaning they passed beyond the area where they're supposed to rest, قال لفتاة موسى said to his son, to his uh, boy or to his servant or to his student he said bring us our meal لقد لقينا من سفرنا هذا نصبا he said we are hungry and we are exhausted these two things for students are what <laughs> hunger and exhaustion are what what do you guys call them huh no, no, I'm not talking about normal. <laughs> They're not normal, by the way. <laughs> we could say these two are the barriers to knowledge. <laughs> yeah? True or no? Yes? Yeah, when you're hungry and you're reading, you're only reading food. All right? Whatever, any word that you have, you would interpret as a word that, that sounds like food. That's, that's what you're thinking of. And when you're exhausted, you're so tired. So Musa had both. So he told his, his student, he said, we have both problems to knowledge. We can continue on without what? Food. And without rest. All right? Uh, anybody study psychology here? Okay, then I won't speak. I, don't I like it when nobody's in the room. I study the subject, then I could say whatever I want. But now it's... <laughs> Especially with medicine. <coughs> anyway, he said, Qala ara'it. He said, do you see? His, the boy is speaking to Musa. He said, remember where we were sitting at the rock next to it, resting? فَإِنِّي نَسِيتُ الْحُوت I forgot to tell you about the fish. Now, Allah in the ayah before said what? He said, He said, نَسِيَ They both forgot. This is another defect. 
one of the major problems and you shouldn't have at a young age. And if you do have at a young age, then you need to consider seeing a specialist. And if you have it severe, then you need to be checked right away. All right? Forgetfulness is a problem. I could understand, mashallah, you know, seven-year-old, my daughter, seven-year-old, eight years old, nine years old, and they tell you, I, I forgot what I ate in the morning. It's too early to forget. So he said, I forgot. And the word forgot was mentioned so many times in this surah. Rasulullah forgot to say what? Insha'Allah, yeah? Remember when they told him about, they asked him, tell us the story of those men who went to the cave. He said, I'll tell you tomorrow. He didn't say, Insha'Allah. Allah remind them, if you forget, you say, Insha'Allah. But if you say, Insha'Allah, would you forget? Keep that in your mind, okay? Can you keep it? Just remember that point. So he said, I forgot to tell you. So he didn't, he said, I forgot. And the shaitan made me forget. And that's, that's a very smart excuse to run out of blame. This is what Muslims do today. And I need to stop here for a second. You tell Muslims anything, anything. Why did you do that, sister? Why did you do that, brother? The first answer that comes up is what? Shaitan, brother. Okay, shayateen are locked in Ramadan. <laughs> and we still do, even the shayateen, I, Allah, they're sitting down, they're locked, and they're saying, what are you guys doing? Like, I, we couldn't even come up with that. <laughs> you see what, what, you see what people are doing in their life? I, I'm not going to go into politics, all right? <laughs> Or anything, but see what people are doing in their lives. There are some plans, there are some people who are doing things right now. Allah, even the shayateen might not have thought about it. Allah, subhanAllah. Hey. Anyway, so he's blaming the shaytan. He said, and the shaytan made me forget. So Musa alayhi salam said, <coughs> he said, don't worry about it. The point is, we want to get to where? We act. Now, they came back, they followed, they traced. Qasas uh, al-Atharima, they went back, they followed their trace. Qasas is like a story. It's like they're following it step by step. They're returning back, going back, till they found the area. And he said, this is where the fish stopped. And they found the man there called Al-Khidr, who is more knowledgeable than Musa, or who has more knowledge than Musa. We'll continue that after some reading, inshallah. Go ahead. فوجد فوجد عبدا من عبادنا آتيناه رحمة من عندنا وعلمناه من لدنا علما قال له موسى هل أتبعك على أن تعلمني مما علمت رشدا قال إنك لن تستطيع معي صبرا وكيف تصبر على ما لم تحط به خبرا قال ستجدني إن شاء الله صابرا ولا أعصي لك أمرا قال فإن اتبعتني فلا تسألني عن شيء حتى أحدث لك منه ذكرا So when they came back, they found this man whose name is Al-Khidr. And Al-Khidr here, Allah knows, you know, that some, some narration said he was called Al-Khidr because wherever he sits at, it turns green. Okay, any area that he sits, like if he's in a desert and he sits, it turns green. Again, did Allah tell us? Allah didn't even mention his name in the Quran. The Prophet ﷺ mentioned him in the Sunnah. And this to show you that also that's, that, that's not the point. Al-Khidr, most authentic, reliable uh, opinion that he is a prophet, all right? Or he was a prophet. Is he still alive? Oh, you guys don't follow Facebook. You didn't see that guy who met Al-Khidr last week and the week before, and he gave him a, a plate with food, and then he told him, I was Al-Khidr, and I'm going to give you something special. So the brother came and he asked, you know, when somebody comes to you like that, you just tell him, all you need to do is just cover yourself well when you sleep. Because that was a dream. 
Khidr is not a life, Allah. Yeah, Khidr is not a life. And even if you meet al Khidr, it's not going to give you anything. Right? You're not going to go with him to kill somebody and don't take it as an excuse. You know? So al Khidr, Musa alayhi salam said, he came back, فَوَجَدَ abdan. Now, they found a slave, a servant, min ibadina, from our servants. Subhanallah, the terminology of the Quran is beautiful. Look what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said. He said, they found abd, a servant, or a slave of our slaves, or one of the servants of Allah. He didn't even call him al-abd, al-salih, the righteous man, even though he's righteous, even though he's, he has knowledge, he has revelation. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wanted to tell you that Allah gives knowledge to whom Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants. And to whom Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala chooses. And this is the difference between dunya and akhirah. This life is giving to those who does good and who does not do good. Does good or evil. Allah gives dunya to whomever. It doesn't matter. Allah gives dunya to whomever. But akhirah is only giving to those whom Allah loves. And part of Akhirah or the guidance, the path to Akhirah is through that knowledge. If Allah bestows knowledge upon you or give you some of the knowledge, then Allah has chosen you for something better. So he said, when they came to him, Musa alayhi salam said to Al-Khidr, Assalamu alaykum. Al-Khidr said, these people here don't give this greeting. How do you know that? As-salam, peace be upon you. He says, not, your people are not familiar with. He said, would you introduce yourself? He said, I am Musa. And Musa said, well, I am, he said, Musa of Bani Israel, the prophet. He said, yes. So Al-Khidr said, okay, how can I help? He said, he said, قَالَ لَهُ مُوسَى هَلْ أَتَّبِعُكَ Can I follow you? على أن تعلمني that you may teach me from what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala have taught you. Now, let's see if you remember, if you're actually awake, inshallah, you are awake. Musa was commanded to travel to Al-Khidr or it happened by accident? What's, no answer? Commanded, yes. So why is he telling him, can I learn with you? Huh? Yeah, but he's commanded by Allah. And Al Khidr is commanded to teach Musa. <laughs> Thank you. The point here is respect. That the point that we're talking about. Respect is a key point when dealing with anyone, any human being. A Muslim, non Muslims, older, younger, respect is the key point. He said, out of respect, can I follow you? Please, I want to learn. You know, some people, they come to ask you, to, and they tell you, Shaykh, ittaqillah, man, give me from the knowledge that Allah gave you, or else you're going to hellfire. Okay. <laughs> you're coming with me. <laughs> if this is the case. If we both go into hellfire, then I don't want to go to hellfire. But this is a problem. People don't know how to approach. So he said, from what Allah have taught you, Rashada. Guidance. Guidance is also a key point. Okay, I'm going to ask you at the end, how many minutes do I have? I'm going to ask you at the end with all these key points that I'm giving you tonight. 15? 20, inshallah. Thank you. Thank you. 15. So he said, there is a difference between having knowledge and being guided. Do you agree? Yes? I'll give you an example that I heard from one of our shiuch. The map. The map, when you turn on your map, it gives you what? Anybody has a phone here? What does your map give you? Huh? La hawla la So UC Davis has a problem with math and maps. <laughs> Okay, the map gives you directions, yeah? Streets. True? Now, 
are we being asked to go through every street on the map to get to our destination? Yeah? MashaAllah. Good luck. I'll see you there. <laughs> if you ever get there, inshallah. See? You need two things. Knowledge and guidance. The map is to guide you. To show you which road to take to get to your destination. So there are so many roads. This is what knowledge does. Knowledge limits those roads and tells you, this way is the way, and this way you should avoid this way. Take this way to get to your destination. So he told him, I don't want any of your knowledge. I want the knowledge that has rashad, that has benefit, that has guidance. He said, Indeed, you will never be, you will never have patience. This is another key word. You cannot achieve anything without patience. If you're not patient for school, you know, mashallah, this, this is what we did. I'll give you life, life experience. You start after high school, you want to go to college. So they tell you, I wanted to be a heart surgeon. So they told me you have to go to school for seven years. And you have to do three years medical school. And then three years uh, internship. And then, I don't know. And then inshallah, when you're 60, 70 years old, I say, assalamu alaikum. <laughs> one, all right, take the other field. You sign up for engineering. Well, you have to take calculus one, two, three. Visit, uh, inshallah, let's, let's, let's look for something else. We don't have the sabr in our life. We don't have the patient for our ibadat. That's why we don't achieve the correct service to Allah. We can't serve Allah right because we're not patient. We're not even patient with our salah now. MashaAllah. Anybody here has a turbo salah? You know what a turbo is? Yeah? Engineer? The only ones who know that is are engineers. A turbo is something that uh, mechanical use to make the engine runs faster. We all pray like that. Yeah? Here you go. Allah <laughs> Done. We're not even patient. If the Imam goes, Allah Akbar in Taraweeh, and then the Imam starts crying, everybody's going, Astaghfirullah. <laughs> and you thought they're doing that because they what? MashaAllah, it's Iman. No. They're like, come on, man. It's not time to cry. Taraweeh is 10 o'clock. We're not having patience. a sabr You cannot achieve any of the knowledge or actions or act upon it without sabr. So Al-Khidr is telling Musa already, you will, not, you, you will never have patience. You can't take what I'm going to be doing. Why is that? Let me ask you a question, and I, I really need someone to answer, or a few people to answer, inshallah. First barrier to learning was what? Remember what we had? Huh? Hunger. Huh? Being exhausted. Huh? Not having commitment. Not having patience. Now, you, you don't have patience with the teacher. You don't have patience with the lesson. There are some people who want to learn just like that. You can't. If you guys remember, if you remember, what was your first math like? I like to talk about math because nobody... Okay. What was your first math like? You start studying what? Numbers. Let's go through the numbers. One, two, three. Oh, my goodness. All right. The numbers. And then add. And then so, mashallah, subtract. Allah. And then... Alhamdulillah, until you get somewhere, <laughs> wherever you're at, <laughs> right? If you stop the sub subtraction, I'm fine. If you're not patient, if you wanted to learn equations and limits and all these weird names, and you're like, no, Sheikh, I want to learn that, or you will get nowhere. So he told him, you won't have patient. Let me ask you a question. Maybe the side who I can't see there. How did Al-Khidr knew that Musa will not have patience? Huh? He was more knowledgeable, okay? Huh? Experience is very important, mashallah. Huh? 
Body language is also very important, yes. Yeah, especially the body language. Somebody comes, Sheikh, I want to study everything. <laughs> Can't study anything. That's the problem. So all, everything that you have said is correct. Imam Shafi rahimahullah said, have patience upon your teacher and your lesson, how you'll gain from it, inshallah. Musa said, inshallah, you'll find me patient. And inshallah, I'll try my best to seek knowledge with, with patience. He said, if you follow me, do not ask any question till I approach you, till I mention it to you. Now, aren't we supposed to ask questions? Yeah? So he's telling him, don't ask. So are we supposed to ask or we're not supposed to ask? Okay. When do you draw a line between when to ask and when not to ask? Huh? Yes. One, two. Clarification for something you don't understand. Three. Something that is important and you want to make sure you heard it right. But things, questions that don't make sense, like the ones we, remember the ones we mentioned, those questions really are not going to benefit you. They're not going to be any good in, in your life. They're not going to do you any good. You know, when somebody said to Abu Hanifa, when he says, you should pray two rak'ah before sun rises. He said, what if the sun don't rise? And Abu Hanifa said, where is the sun going to go? Like, okay. <laughs> he, he, if I was Abu Hanifa, I will just slap him and uh, hit him with something. That, uh, yeah. So he said, فَانْطَلَقَ Now, so rule number one was, don't ask questions to test Moses' patient. To see if he's going to be patient. Because now, from now on, we're going to see very quickly, inshallah, that Allah would reveal the unseen or some of the unseen, which is our problems as Muslims today. So take these points. I can go through the rest of the story very quickly, inshallah. But um, let me give you this, these points, inshallah, or these things very quickly. Number one, Allah has a plan for everything, okay? Even the things that we are unaware of, unaware of. Now, in the story of Musa, Allah has a plan for Musa to travel. Allah has a plan for Musa when he was a baby. What happened to him when he was a baby? His mother took him. Yeah, he was breastfed by his mother. And then what? She she put him in the cat in the in the basket and she threw him in the sea. Yeah. Well, it doesn't make sense. You have a baby, an infant. And you're throwing him in the sea? Yes, because Allah plans that way. Allah plans for you to go to the school that Allah wants, not the school that you want. Because Allah knows that you'll do better at that school than being at that school. So Allah's plan, number one, just count with me, inshallah. Number one is what? Can someone say it quickly? Huh? Huh? Plan. Number two, Allah's plan is better than our plan. We have to believe that. We, we don't see sometimes the justification or the reason behind things. Allah's justice, subhanahu wa ta'ala, has been established and we need to learn to submit to it. You know, some people today, when they see the situation of the ummah, and this is a big problem, all the fitan and the problems that the ummah are going through, they wish something. Like, you know, um, I wish that the Syrian president dies. Okay, if he died, he's one person. He have killed how many? Huh? MashaAllah, almost reached a million now. Yeah. Well, will that be justice? He's he's gonna be only killed once. He's gonna be dead once. We we don't see that. Well, leave it leave it to Allah. Leave that punishment. Leave that uh, um, planning to Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala for justice. Musa's story teaches us why do things happen to us the way they happen to us. And this is the biggest problem that Muslims and non-Muslims are facing. Why do bad things happen to us? You know, I'll tell you a story to clarify that. You're on the freeway. I like that story. I, I invented it, okay? 
You're on the freeway, driving, going for an interview. In the middle of the way, you had a flat tire on the freeway. What is the first thing that you do? Huh? What is it? Yeah, after, after you pull over, of course. Huh? Second thing. I'll tell you what you do. Everybody does. I don't, I don't get why. They go down, they start hitting the tire. I really don't understand why they do that. Like it's going to inflate and the car is just going to be driven by itself. All right? So they go that, they, they hit the tire and then they remember, oh, they have insurance. So they call their insurance. Anyway, the insurance comes after an hour, they fix it. Now they're late for work or for interview. The same person drives a mile or two ahead. There's a major accident, two cars or three cars, and everyone in that accident died. What would that person do? He's going to go and kiss the tire. Yeah? He's going to go down and literally kiss the tire. Say, Thank you, tire. You saved my life. Now, the moment that he had a flat tire, he wasn't thinking that way. Because he was only thinking about the evil that comes out of that. But he wasn't thinking that Allah had a plan that is better for him than him driving to that work. Does that make that, the point clear? Why do things happen? Musa, when he was a baby, if he stayed with his mother, he would have been what? Huh? Killed, yeah? But then she put him in a basket in the middle of the sea, which most likely he will drown. But he was saved. He got to Fir'aun. Now, Fir'aun saw him. He brought his mother to breastfeed him. And he paid her money. So we, oh, okay, the story made sense. Now we know why he was thrown into the into the sea. But at that time, now Musa, he saw a ship. Al-Khidr did what? He made a hole in the ship. Two, he did what? Rebuilt the, the wall and he killed a child. Now, all what Musa saw was the harmful matters or the things that are problematic with uh, or the evil that comes out. He saw the hole in the ship, but he didn't know that there was a king ahead who takes in the ships that are fixed so when he made a hole in the ship that saved the people of the ship and that also saved their ship and when he killed the child the child is entering Jannah at a young age and his, his parents are saved from his harm when he rebuilt the wall to a village that they are very miser cheap, stingy and then he did what? When they rebuilt the wall, he saved the treasure of two orphan children. Musa didn't see the unseen. He only saw what he could realize and he saw it as evil. But Allah wanted to teach him, not him. Allah wanted to teach us. Because every story in the Quran is to teach us a lesson. That in our life, whatever happens to us, happens to us by the command of Allah. And whatever happens to you, if you think it's evil, don't look at it this way. Look at the positive behind it and the wisdom behind it, even if you can't see it. You sometimes can't tell. One minute, Father. You sometimes can't tell why do things happen the way they happen. And if you realize later or you see later the wisdom, then you're like, okay, makes sense. But if you don't see that, you're still displeased. So. I will end with that hadith, inshallah. <clears throat> the Prophet sallallahu said, whoever goes through a problem, uh, despairs, hardship, grief, and he's patient, Allah will give him the reward of his patient and the reward of what have happened to him. Whether he see it now or not. Because as we said, there is the unseen. So, what you see is that you are sick, but the unseen says you are granted paradise, Jannah. You are late for work, but you're saved from an accident. You know, this happened once, and literally, uh, subhanAllah, just remember, I was at the airport. MashaAllah, I, <clears throat> I get a VIP treatment. You guys know what that is, yeah? 12 S's, not 4 S's. Everybody gets 4 S's, I get 12 S's. 12 S's means extra, extra security at the end, all right? 
So anyway, they took me to a site. They searched my bag. They searched my clothes. They, يعني they asked me about <coughs> every human being that I have met in my history since I was born. Anyway, I got late for my flight. I was angry to a point that, يعني, I, I, don't know, I don't know what I would have done. 30 minutes later, there was a problem with one of the uh, plane's wing, and some damage happened, and then they had to evacuate everybody in the middle of no, it, it was like, and I was just sitting at the airport watching, and the lady says, flight so and so, go, go. I'm like, Alhamdulillah, I got canceled. It's too late to say Alhamdulillah. I didn't see the unseen. I just saw my problem. But if I had trust in Allah, so the, the Prophet ﷺ said, if you're displeased with what Allah has done to you, then you get no reward because you're not patient. And two, you, get, you are displeased and you get to be displeased by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So I'll conclude, inshallah, a few things that we have learned. I hope, inshallah, the story was... I haven't finished the story. There's more to say. So I hope, inshallah, there will be a session next year, hopefully, in life, if we're, if we're still alive. So a few things that we have taken today. Number one, anybody remember? Can someone give me five points that we have taken home today, inshallah? Five points. Okay, can you act without knowledge? Why is everybody saying hungry? Are you guys hungry? Like, everybody's focused. It's just that point. Like, every question I ask, they go like, hungry is a barrier for me. <laughs> Are you saying you can't understand me because you're hungry? <laughs> okay, so hunger is a barrier of knowledge. There you go. Two. Huh? Tired. Three. Not having patience. Commitment is a key to success. And if you want to do the righteous action, you should have preceded by knowledge. So if we take home knowledge first, and then learning actions, and then acting upon that, and the best of service that we could do after doing it to Allah is to do it to others and give it away to others, inshallah. Jazakumullah khair. Sorry for taking your time. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless you.